As I was editing this video, I thought of an anecdote about when Hungary declared war on the United States. So, when Roosevelt was informed that Hungary had declared war, he asked his advisor, well, is it a republic or a kingdom, this European country? To which he replied, it is a kingdom. Ah, so they must have a king. No, they have an admiral. All right. So we have to fear the Hungarian fleet. Well, no, it is a landlocked country. Okay, but do they have territorial disputes with France, England, or the United States, the countries that I just declared war on? No, but they do have territorial disputes with Romania and Czechoslovakia. All right, so could we use those countries against them? Will they declare war on them as well? No, they are allied with them. And I think this funny anecdote shows the complex situation and status quo of Hungary during the 30s and at the beginning of the Second World War. I am currently in Veszprém, one of Hungary's oldest towns, even though it was destroyed in the 16th century by the Ottomans. So most buildings in here have been rebuilt in the 18th century. It has a rich history, beautiful buildings, and for the past 900 years the Bishop of Veszprém has crowned all Hungarian queens. So join me as we explore this historical little town. We're currently standing on Ovarostar, and the square's single most impressive and dominant building is the Bishop's Palace. A typically massive Baroque pal by Jakob Fellner, with the distinction of having had the first flush toilets in Hungary installed in the late 18th century. So that's this building with the first Hungarian flush toilets. Now, what's interesting during the palace's construction is that they uncovered this tomb and this is the Gisela chapel which supposedly houses the body of Gisela, the queen of King Stephen from the 10th century. And right next to this Trinity statue over there, that's St. George's Chapel and the son of King Stephen, Imre, here is said to have vowed his oath of celibacy and the fact that he had taken his oath meant that his canonization, so he became a saint, meant that such as Stephen and the latter-day King Laszlo, it cemented Arpad's adherence to Catholicism and gave the Hungarians their own saints with whom to identify. Inside are statues of Stephen and Gisela, and behind here as well. I'll show you those in a second. The statue beneath which a wreath was laid is Saint Imre. Like I said previously, he was he vowed an oath of celibacy, cementing Arpad's power and his decision to adhere to Catholicism. Veszprém is located northwest of Lake Balaton and behind me what you can see are the Baconi Hills. The city is built over five hillsides and we're currently in the old quarter with the palace or the castle rather that was overtaken in 1552 by the Ottomans and the rest of the entire city was leveled hence the reason why the buildings generally are from the 18th century. This used to be the primary school, boys' school of Veszprém. Uh, it was built in the 17th century, commissioned the year, uh, the century afterwards, where Maria Theresa, in order to establish, it is one of the better schools of Hungary. And as you can see now, it is completely abandoned. There is nothing left that is reminiscent of this once. Life, I assume, lively school. It's a missed opportunity by not saying House of History there. Mm -hmm. 
Saint Michael is a saint, the patron of Vesprem. This statue was erected in 2017 on the day of the Archangel, uh, commissioned by public donations, and it resembles Saint Michael towering above Satan on the ground and jabbing a javelin or a spear in his heart, and it symbolizes the the victory of good over evil. I ran into and wanted to record this old town wall that probably is, are the remnants of the Ottoman invasion or rather the repelling of the Ottoman invasion and the eventual sacking of the city. But then behind me, this incredible building with its, it's a pretty eccentric building and the architecture, I can't really place it. It's not something that I expected over here and I can't figure out what exactly it is when it was built and what it symbolizes. But nevertheless, it is a beautiful building and the details are astonishing. It's located pretty far away from the center, from the Castle Hill, which proves that Veshprem has some beautiful hidden secrets. Over here, this is the Deshe Lasko Museum behind the trees at the Ershebet Shitani. It features an incredible array of historical exhibits from all periods, so from the Bronze Age all the way to pottery of the Romans and Roman mosaics. It also features regional folk costumes and material on the Bacchanese highwaymen. But when we walk a little bit further, then a little bit hidden behind here is the Bacconi House. And the Bacconi House is a 1930s clone of a traditional Hungarian homestead and the inside is filled with peasant artifacts so this is a well it's a recreations but in the 1930s generally houses were built like this and looked like this and unfortunately everything is closed today even though it's a Tuesday so you'd expect it to be open but nevertheless <laughs> hidden within the woods with a path towards the forest is a nice nice little remnant of a 1930s peasant house and the way people used to live aside from this large building and a bit of a battered building over there hidden behind the trees now it is very quick to overlook but over here there's a plaque commemorating Shandar Pitofi and Sander Petofi was the national poet during the Hungarian Revolution and he wrote the Hungarian national song. Um, he eventually signed up in the army in his early 20s, I think he was 23 or 24. And he would eventually die uh, in battle in Transylvania, never having his body located. But Sander Petofi is a national hero to the Hungarians and basically in any town you come, there is a memorial of him and I just showed you this large building but when we take a closer look over there I think the flags are very interesting there's a Hungarian flag obviously the second from the left then on the right side there's a European flag and I have to admit I'm not too sure what the most left flag is but the most right flag is the Sekler flag which is the land the historical land of Hungarians that are now living in Transylvania and in 1920, after the First World War, the Treaty of Trianon was signed and all the Hungarians in the Sacred Land, they were assigned to Romania. Transylvania basically became Romanian, even though large parts of there had an ethnic Hungarian majority living there. And while we're still in Veszprém, I think this is a very, very good time to mention that we're going to leave this city right now and we're going to the Trianon Museum. It is a 30 minute drive from here and it will perfectly explain exactly what happened, what happened in 1920 and why the Sacred flag is still nearly 100 years later, 99 years later, hanging on the town hall. So join me as we drive towards the Trianon Museum. I am currently standing in front of the Trianon Museum in Hungary and the Treaty of Trianon was signed in 1920. It was between Hungary and the victors of the First World War. 
And when the Hungarian delegation went to Paris in order to negotiate, they figured there would be very tough negotiations. What they didn't expect was the fact that there wouldn't be any negotiations at all. They would simply have to accept the very, very harsh peace terms stated by the Allied powers. And eventually Hungary would only retain 29% of their territory and Woodrow Wilson's national principles would not be adhered to at all. There were referenda where the population of several Hungarian regions would vote to stay with Hungary, but those referenda were not adhered to. And 100 years later, today, it is still a very, very sensitive point in Hungarian history because of the feeling of injustice that had been done to the Hungarian nation. Their territory had been destroyed. They were suddenly in economic despair. Their national resources, they were removed. They didn't have anything. They didn't have a market to sell their products on. And a period of extreme economic turmoil would follow. And outside over here, there are two small memorials, one commemorating Hungary as it was 100 years ago. And you can see in the stone the old outlines of Hungary, of which only 29% is left nowadays. And over here, it is the memorial of an eagle that is bound and is unable to move. And let's go inside of this museum and see what we'll find. And this room is filled with some very imposing statues and, well, I believe there are pictures of people that played a m large role during the time of the Treaty of Trianon. It is very difficult because there's no English, German or Russian translations, so I'm a bit lost often at what things mean. But nevertheless, even though I can't understand the majority of it, it is a very, very interesting experience. It's a very depressing history, but also a history of carrying on and of a very strong-willed nation. After Hungary's communist coup d'etat in 1990, Mabela Kun, a period of white terror commenced, and Bal Pronay is the general or military officer over here on the top row and he's considered to be the most brutal Hungarian national army officers leading the white terror against the communists basically purging communists from society here are more photographs of Paul Ponai and I think the nice little detail on his hat shows the Hungarian coat of arms this room is dedicated to the communist coup in 1919 under Béla Kun. And on this side, there is a lot of white propaganda. So the white army were basically the Hungarian conservatives and even centrists um, under Miklos Horthy, the admiral, who would eventually rule Hungary until 1944, when the Nazis deposed of him in Operation Panzerfaust. And here, this is a little poster of Horthy and these are, this is a mixture of anti-Bolshevik and pro-conservative propaganda. And then over here you get the communist propaganda, including the nooses in which people were hanged or hung. And these are photographs of the Hungarian communists that swept Hungary in 1919 and tried to overtake government and they did manage to for a little while. I think an interesting and very ironic detail is the fact that Béla Kun, the leader of the Hungarian communists that seized power, he eventually fled to the Soviet Union after Horthy overtook Hungary again and reclaimed power. And Béla Kun was one of the many, many foreign communist leaders that seeked refuge in the Soviet Union that were executed and purged by Stalin in 1938 and his terror regime cost the lives of millions of people, army officers, regular people, people that were innocent, people that were guilty. And it really was a time of the revolution eating its own children. And even Béla Kun, a dedicated communist that 
wanted to create a communist egalitarian society of Hungary would eventually be put against the wall and shot. This is a poster for the USA and it says, citizens of the USA, would you accept this peace? It would be the same which was forced upon Hungary and it shows a massive cut from the United States. And it does that for every country, for Finland, for Sweden, for Italy which loses Rome and many surrounding territories and even Belgium loses large parts of their land. It's a very odd thing to wrap your head around that this occurred 100 years ago, um, especially considering the fact that Hungary was part of the Austrian Empire and it did not act in an autonomous way. Welcome to Papa, the last stop on our road trip today. And this little town got big and grew as a small miller's town during the Middle Ages, uh, having 26 mills next to the Tapuka River, which was the lifeline of this little village. And I expected a sleeping little town as it never had industrialized, which is the reason for its Baroque center, which still remains intact. Instead, we found an interesting combination of a beautiful, well-kept mansion and local youth rebelling against probably the sleepiness of this town and a little bit of a smudgy church behind us, though the frescoes inside certainly are amazing. The church behind me was commissioned by Bishop Josef Esterhazy and the big mansion which is located behind this as well. It just shows the influence, the wealth and the absolute overbearing grip of the Esterhazys on the region and the beautiful buildings they commissioned and the philanthropy that they embarked upon. So join me as we explore Papa, a small miller's town which isn't that quiet anymore. In the 18th century, Papa experienced its peak, its golden age, so to say, because of the German settlers that were motivated by the Esterhazy family to settle in this little town. And nowadays I say it is the economic and tourist region, or rather economic and tourist center of the region this being the main street, I have my genuine doubts about that. We've reached the Esterhazy mansion and two gargoyles with the family crest guard the place and guard the fence. And over here we have this incredible building on a town that, in all honesty, doesn't have that many of these buildings and I didn't expect it because well it was a small miller's town during the medieval times but so far I haven't seen anything that is reminiscent of that and this was built in the 18th century commissioned by the Esterhazys and these patrons of the town they managed to get German settlers into this town Papa, which made it experience its golden age. Interestingly enough, after being a medieval miller's town, not having industrialized, having 26 mills next to its local river stream, this incredible building was built. And it just goes to show the vast amount of wealth that this family possessed. And over the next couple of weeks, we will visit more towns in Hungary where the Esterházys were prominent, as the Esterházys were prominent in northwestern Hungary, the place that we're touring through. The Zimmermann Utza is a remnant of the German settlers that settled here ages ago, centuries ago, as Zimmermann certainly isn't a Hungarian name. Behind me is the reformist school that was built in 1531 and continues to educate young boys to this day in Calvinist thought. But next to it, and this rather surprises me, is a gigantic church. And well, I've rapidly tried to discover what exactly 
this church is, what its name is, what its purpose is, and I couldn't really find it. Couldn't quite clearly find what church it is. My Hungarian isn't that good, and well, everything is closed. It's nearly night now, but I think it's the Franciscan or Franciscan church, rather, uh, built in the late 17th century, so that's 1674 this was built, and it is very well maintained, uh, surprised by it. It is better maintained than the church on the main square. Another interesting detail of the Calvinist church that's around the corner is that two great Hungarian names were schooled there. One was the novelist, Morio Kai, of which this is a statue, and the other, as you probably know after you've watched this video, and we have to walk towards the other side of the square in front of the church, but We've seen him before in this video, and it is Sander Petofi. Sander Petofi, the poet who in his 20s joined the Hungarian army and fought the Austrian and Russian troops, but who also wrote Nemzeti Dal, or the national Hungarian song which was sung during the revolution. And both Jokai's and Petofi's statues stand in front of this church as a testament. Mm -hmm to two great names that the Calvinist school produced over the past four centuries that it has been in operation. We've come to an end of our exploration today. We've seen the city, the town that crowned Queens for nine centuries. We've seen the Trianon Museum and an attempt to break the Hungarian spirit. And now we've seen a Hungarian mill town, a medieval town that managed to somehow transform that to survive the industrial revolution by not industrializing and as a result having kept a rich center of baroque buildings yet without renovation and i believe without any funds after the fall of the war and no proper investments those baroque buildings once showing the might and the wealth of this area the esterhazy mansion and the church commissioned by the bishop has now fallen to a shadow of its former self. Thank you for joining me on this adventure today and if you like what you're seeing consider subscribing to my channel and make sure you join me next time as we explore more of the west of Hungary.